Hello, and welcome to Shaking and Sipping. This is the show where we shake up a cocktail or other mixed drink, talk a bit about its history, some variants, have a sip, and see how it is. We're continuing our quest to work through the IBA's official list of cocktails to see how those stack up. We're in the second section, the Contemporary Classics, and this week's Contemporary Classic is the Mai Tai. Now, I think the Mai Tai is obviously deserving of its status as a classic. Um, I think everyone's heard of one. Uh, Whether or not everyone's had one or certainly had a a good and proper one, uh, I'm less certain. But everyone knows that a Mai Tai is a thing. Popular drink definitely deserves to be a classic. I've got quite a bit to say about the Mai Tai, and we've got to look at how to make one of the ingredients for it, etc. So in the interest of breaking that up a little bit, I'm just going to start by making the IBA version straight through with not a ton of explanation. And then while we're sipping on that, and if you want to make one of your own to sip along with, then we'll dive into how to make one of the ingredients, the history, etc. Let's get right to that IBA spec. All right, so I've got some shaker tins here, and I'm going to actually start off with my Orja syrup, which is one of the things we'll be discussing in the next part. It is very thick, so that's why we're starting with that, so we can uh, help clean that out of our jigger as we go. I want 15 milliliters, or about half of a fluid ounce, of the Orgia. Then we need some lime juice, and those of you who know the history know that this is the first place where my method is going slightly off, perhaps, from the historical. But again, we shall get there. This one I'm looking for 30 milliliters, or one fluid ounce. Then we're going to add some simple, this is my 2 to 1 white, we're looking for about a quarter ounce, so 7.5 milliliters. Uh, depending on how sweet your orgia is, you may or may not really need this, but um, it does not hurt anything certainly. Then we need some dry curacao, we want another 15 milliliter or half ounce pour of this. And then we need some rums. IBA calls for an amber Jamaican rum. I'm using Appleton Estate Signature, which it's nice to have in front of me because I reference this occasionally on the show and can never remember the name. I just persist on calling it VX, which hasn't been called in years. One ounce, 30 milliliters. And then the IBA calls for something called Martinique Molasses Rum. And this is actually a good job on its point. It even drops a note to say that this is not an agricole, and it's not. We'll talk about that more in the future. You'll notice this is not from Martinique. Um, this is Cruzan Blackstrap, so this is from uh, St. Croix. Um, and there's reasons that I'm using it. We'll possibly talk about them in a bit. We also want 30 milliliters, or one ounce of our stand-in for a Martinique Molasses Rum. Then the other piece that's going to go slightly off from how you might expect the drink to be made, but I'm just following what the IBA says here, is it just says to shake this with ice. So I'm just going to grab the ice that we normally use to shake things and shake that up. And then the IBA just says to pour, which I'm going to interpret as an open pour, which I think is right. Um, And they say for a double rocks or a highball glass. Weird. Highball glass isn't traditional, doesn't really make sense. Double rocks, I don't love as a name, just because different uh, brands mean very different things by double rocks. Um, I'm interpreting it as double old fashioned. It might mean something more like this size glass which although it looks similar in size, actually a couple ounces less. Not really sure. We're gonna go with this. They ask for three garnishes. I'm only gonna use two of them. One is a sprig of mint, which they don't call for, but there's constant debate about whether you should do that to your mint first in order to open it up. I'm not convinced it makes a difference, but we've done it. And then they call for a twist of lime. They don't actually say to express it, and in their picture it's sort of curled up, so I don't think they do express it, but we we will just for fun. Then they also call for a wedge of pineapple, which I'm not going to use. A, I don't have any. B, I don't like it in here, which we'll talk about in a minute. And that is an IBA spec Mai Tai, other than the pineapple garnish. Intense smells. 
So right on the nose, the mint, the lime, the sweetness, all kind of present there. A little bit of those almost spice-like notes out of the blackstrap. Uh, the blackstrap's not a spice drum, but it has a lot of those really molasses-y, burnt sugar, which are sort of spice-adjacent notes. Um, getting all of that together. And that's, that's pretty good. So it's hard to even describe everything that's happening there. There's a sort of muted sweetness right on the front of the tongue, where there's almost a little bit of rum happening that's sort of stopping it from being too sweet. Opens into a place that suddenly gets very sweet, but in a sort of weird, molassesy, off-putting way, where at the very same time I start feeling the line right on sort of the sides of my cheeks. And then as it goes further back, it just sort of opens up more. I get a little bit more of the rum. I'm getting some of the orgia, um, some of that almond base sort of further back, nice and smooth. Just a hint of rum at the back of the throat, um, which is uh, the Appleton, which is not a especially funky or hot Jamaican rum, but has just a hint of that rum burn just to end the drink. It's lovely. The mint, I think, is key. Just the uh, the olfactory element of that while you're tasting really kind of blends everything together. That's delicious. All right. Let's talk a bit about the Mai Tai. So this is a classic drink. This is one of, if not the most famous, of the sort of exotic drinks. Um, sort of category that includes tiki drinks, doesn't include some other drinks that might seem exotic, but it's a whole sort of time and place thing. I was gonna really go into detail and talk a bunch about Don the Beachcomber and Trader Vic. I just think that's gonna take too long, so that'll have to come up in a further episode. But what you need to know is those two guys sort of wrote the books on exotic drinks. Um, and so this drink occasionally gets credited to Don, Don the Beachcomber, um, he's claimed to have invented it, and he certainly is sort of the OG of these sorts of drinks. I don't believe he invented this. Um, Trader Vic also claims to have invented it, and I believe his story. When Trader Vic was working at one of the Hawaiian uh, hotel bars that he ran, uh, he's said to have created this drink. Some stories say he was actually trying to make a copy of one of Don's recipes, which I think is possible, though it's a very different recipe. If that's what he was going for, he totally messed up. Um, but he gave it to someone to try, his version of either brand new drink or Don recipes copy, and they said Mai Tai something something something, which was Tahitian for the best, it's out of this world. The Mai Tai, I think is how you say that, Tahitian phonology, not something I'm really up on, um, means something like the best. Um, and so that is where the name comes from for this drink. I believe that it was Vic who made it. There's a whole story behind um, the ingredients that he used and how it changed over the years. Uh, and the IBA's version is definitely sort of a direct copy of Trader Vic's third version of the drink. Now, while Vic never published the recipes, at least not for the early version, some of his recipes leaked out later and he did eventually release some and whatever, but he did not for many, many years. Uh, we think that the recipe is actually pretty similar to what I just made. Maybe some slight proportion differences, but pretty much that. The only difference being the rum. So his initial version only had one rum in it, and it was Ray and Nephew's 17 year. Now, if you do a lot of mixology, especially with rums, you'll know J. Ray and Nephew's Overproof. It's an amazing uh, white, unaged Jamaican rum, bottled way overproof. It's an awesome product, both on its own and popping in simple drinks and to use as bases for various infusions and things. I love Ray and Nephew Overproof. It's a really cool product. But back in the day, and this is back in the 40s and before, they used to make really long-aged rums. Big granddaddy was the 17 year. Very long aged, a lot of oak, slightly mellowed, but all Jamaican pot stilled rum. And this product apparently was amazing. Unfortunately, 17 years age on a rum takes a while to do, there's a lot of economics involved. 
they weren't making very much of it. And it turns out even back then, they ran out. <laughs> Supposedly because Trader Vic basically bought all of it. So he moved to their 15 year, which he said was almost as good. Fantastic, problem solved. They ran out. <laughs> so at this point, he started mixing and matching a couple different rums. And so we don't have an exact idea of what rums he was using, but he mentions a Jamaican rum and he mentions a Martinique rum. And so nowadays, if you know Martinique rums, you're thinking rum agricole. And rum agricoles we've talked about before, we had uh, Clément and maybe something else before. Um, those are rums that are made from the sugarcane juice um, rather than as a byproduct of like sugar extraction. Um, very different rums. They're bright. They are um, not what you would think of as like a dark syrupy rum at all. However, and this is why I credit the IBA for making the note that this is not an agricole. Back in the day, Martinique had a second line of rums going, and these were types of black rums. And these were fairly reasonably priced, but they were rums that were not sugarcane juice made. These were more in the tradition of some of the Jamaican black rums. These are molasses rums. These were, you know, aged, but they were also colored. They had some additives sometimes. Um, not a ton of age, but some age. And so that's why in my version, I used the Cruzon Blackstrap. This is actually much closer in practice to just about anything you'd find on Martinique today. Um, and so this is the idea is he used something like this mixed with a younger, certainly older than this, um, but a younger than you know 17 year Jamaican rum. So he got that pop funk out of this and he got some age, some depth, some darkness out of that uh, Martinique rum. Now, there are other ways to do it, and we will get to that in a moment, but that's the basic difference that changed over time. Unfortunately, the drink became popular, and lots of stuff changed at lots of places. So I really credit the IBA here. I like to complain about them a lot, so credit where it's due here. They got it, I think, pretty much spot on. Again, you could quibble about exact proportions, you could quibble that you should have specified the Jamaican rum should have at least a little bit of age on it, but they got it roughly right. Lots of places don't. This is a very famous sort of name of a drink that people know is tropical. I looked up recipes a bunch of different you know, sort of rando places just to confirm that I was right, that no one really makes this right, and so many recipes have orange juice, pineapple juice, cherry juice. Um, all just like Bacardi as the rum component, you know, all kinds of different stuff where it's just sort of like, yeah, that's the rum and juice drink, right? And no, not really. Um, much more simple drink, always all lime. And definitely some kind of funk in your rum. Doesn't have to be especially funky, but if you're using all, you know, Bacardi or Don Q or whatever, unaged, uh, it's really not going to work. Luckily, like I said, the IBA got it right. Lots of places do get it right. And I think it's a drink worth sort of celebrating a little bit, especially if you make it with good products. To that end, we should talk about the new ingredient that we haven't had on the show before. This is Orja. There's a little bit of uh, debate about how to pronounce that name. O-R-G-E-A-T. Um, Orjat, Orjo, Orja. Orja. Um, I go with Orja. I believe that is roughly correct. It actually comes from the same Latin root word, which means barley water, as where we get like the word orchata and different versions of that. And so there's a whole bunch of traditions sort of surrounding the Mediterranean, North Africa, Spain, France, Italy, etc., of various sort of water-based infusions from either grains or nuts. So like I said, you get orchata in Spain, which is you know, tiger nuts, or the Latin American version of horchata, which is rice-based. The, the original was barley. This one is almond. And so what this is essentially is a rich, simple syrup full of almond milk um, with a little bit of extra sort of fruitiness from some orange blossom water and rose water. You can definitely buy pre-made orja. I was going to do a side-by-side -side for this episode. Uh, unfortunately, the good quality commercial product was out at 
three different stores I went to, and the bad quality product was only in stock at one store, and I was thinking about getting it anyway just to compare how crap it is, but it was only available in like a two liter bottle, which I would never get through, so I didn't buy it. Most commercial orgias kinda suck. They're basically simple syrup with a squeeze of almond extract in them. The mouth feels wrong, the color's wrong, just doesn't really do it. Um, there are a couple brands that are okay. But, for y'all, I made my own. Uh, I've got footage of that, so I'll play that back, kind of overcut, but what you're basically going to do is you're gonna put uh, some raw almonds into water, starting from cold, bring them up to a boil. Once they begin boiling and are blanched, you're gonna drain those off, reserving the water. You're gonna then go ahead and blitz up about half the almonds, add in about a cup and a half or so of that reserved water, blend it some more till you've got this creamy, sort of breakfast cereal-y looking thing, uh, like hot cereal, like oatmeal-y looking thing. You're gonna pull that out, repeat with the other remaining half. Then you're gonna go ahead and start the laborious cheesecloth based process. So you're gonna put cheesecloth in a uh, like sieve or a strainer over a bowl, and then with more cheesecloth, slowly take a spoonful or a ladleful of a time of your processed version and milk that out. Um, once you go through all of that, then you're gonna let, then you're going to um, strain that through more cheesecloth back into your pan. And you're gonna add double the amount by volume of uh, castor sugar. So I ended up with just over two cups of um, of my sort of almond milk. Uh, so I added in about four cups of castor sugar, heat that over high, stirring constantly until you make a syrup. It's gonna take 15, 20 minutes. Uh, then you're gonna take it off the heat. You gotta keep stirring almost constantly or else it'll start to separate. The fats will form out into like a skin on top, which is no fun. Once it's getting there on the cooling process, you're gonna add in a little bit of uh, rose water. You're gonna add in a little bit of orange blossom water. Um, and optionally, you add in a little bit of rum. Theoretically, it makes it last longer. I've mentioned before in other syrups and things, I'm not convinced that that actually does anything, but I did, uh, you'll see it in the video. Um, then once it's completely, completely cool, strain it through yet more cheesecloth into a sterilized bottle. And then folks say it'll store for at least a month. I think it should honestly store pretty much forever if you followed those instructions. That's a greater than two to one simple syrup and we're holding it refrigerated. So it really should hold pretty much forever. The sort of uh, curveball is because of all the lipids that we're possibly getting out of the almonds, what's giving us that extra mouthfeel and separation are sort of fats and pieces of fats. Those can harbor certain anaerobic bacteria, which can do weird things, especially contained like in the fridge if you're at a low temperature. So I don't know for sure. I don't plan to throw this out in a month if I haven't finished it, but um, I will not be responsible if you hold on to yours for two, two years and get ill. Don't blame me. Now I should credit for both the research on this drink, I promise I'll make another version soon, and for my Orgia recipe, um, I talked a lot about imbibe, as we've looked at drinks from sort of the early, early era, that's my go-to, for drinks in the sort of exotic space. Smuggler's Cove, this is the Bible for that space. This is from Martin Kate and Rebecca Kate. They run a bar called The Smuggler's Cove. Um, Martin used to work in Trader Vic's, this is the source on all the history for this type of stuff. The recipe I got for the Orgia and the basic recipe I'm gonna use when I make a proper Mai Tai in just a moment. Uh, the only thing I'm not gonna follow from them is they make a special simple syrup specifically for their Mai Tais. It's just a simple syrup that has a pinch of salt and some vanilla extract in it. I'm not gonna bother making a separate simple syrup for that. Other than that, we'll follow their recipe. All right, so for round two, we're gonna follow Smuggler's Coast version, as I said. It's gonna be similar. We're gonna change the rum, change the proportions, and change a little bit of the garnish and serving of it to get it a little bit more uh, historically accurate. We're gonna start off again with our orgia. I want this time only about a quarter of an ounce, so right eight milliliters. We also want a quarter ounce or about eight milliliters of simple. Um, like I said, I'm not making their version, but instead of using my white, I'm gonna use my Demerara. This is a 
two to one Demerara. We've talked about making in previous episodes. For lime juice, we're looking for three quarters of an ounce, so that's about 23 milliliters. Um, here we're going to make a slight change just to how we juice it after I, this is just the remaining half lime from the first version. Back in the day at Trader Vic's, they did not have this style juicer that we are familiar with today. They had what was called a sun-kissed style juicer, which I've never used, but look useless. Um, a sun-kissed style juicer basically just squeezes the limes uh, on two sides. So it seems exactly the same as doing it by hand. I'm not sure what the juicer really did for you. If you've used one, let me know how great it is. But that is important for the garnish of this drink. So we're gonna go ahead and just try to juice that by hand. Certainly less effective than a modern juicer. Okay, so that is our 23-ish ounces, or 23-ish milliliters, about three quarters of an ounce of lime juice. We're gonna use 15 milliliters, or half an ounce of that same Pierre Fran Dry Curacao. And then for rum, I picked up for this a bottle of Denizen Merchants Reserve. This is a product that Martin Kate of Smuggler's Cove fame actually worked with the Denizen folks on. And this is a mixture. It's 80% eight-year-old Jamaican, 100% pot still, with 20% of an actual um, molasses rum from a Martinique. So, really trying to get the vibe of um, Trader Joe's third version, which was whatever that blend was of rums that he didn't really share exactly. This is hopefully, I've never actually tried this, but well, it's potent. A lot of Jamaican on the nose. A little bit of brown sugar though, I can kind of see that coming through. We're looking for 60 milliliters or two fluid ounces. All right, so that's all the ingredients, but we need to change the ice. So this is a drink that is typically served over crushed ice. That may be what the IBA meant as their photo looked kind of like crushed ice, but they didn't say it, so we didn't do it. But for this version, we will, so that means we need to break out the Lewis bag. All right, we've had out the Lewis bag before, but this is just a canvas bag designed for crushing some ice in. What we're looking for is a standard ice scoop worth of crushed ice. So if you've got a bunch of pre-crushed ice um, and you've got one of those standard ice scoops, you're set. That's gonna work perfectly. Just grab about one of those. If you don't, um, guess how many ice cubes it's gonna be, put them into a bag and beat the crap out of them. Now, if your crushed ice is especially small and uniform, um, I would go ahead and throw in a couple of big ice, or you know, medium ice cubes as well to get good agitation. Mine is sort of not uniform and all over the place as it is, uh, and I think I have too much as it is. So we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna go ahead and give a brief shake. Don't need too much shaking, so much small ice. Uh, gonna get plenty of cooling and agitation, and then we'll deal with strain. All right, we're gonna again go into a double old fashioned. This again should be an open pour, since I just totally eyeballed that amount of ice. I'm gonna have um, a wide open gate here, and then uh, if I need to stop it, I can if I have too much ice. I think I have just a hair too much. That's almost perfect. Turns out that was 100% perfect. Okay. And for our garnish, the reason we needed to squeeze the lime as so, we want to float the lime in there. It's supposed to look like an island, um, which it kind of does. And then we also want our sprig of mint. We'll do that again of dubious usefulness. And that is a hopefully fairly traditional and accurate to what Trader Vic would have served you, not right at the beginning, but by the mid 50s, late 50s, this is what you would have gotten at Trader Vic's, I think. Mm. Mm. So that's truly wonderful. Um, that rum is 
definitely a bit of an improvement on the Cruzon Appleton blend. Not that there was anything wrong with that. But it's really part of the rum is blending with that rich simple that I use and the Orgia uh, to give sort of a middle that's sweet and rich and kind of dark, but um, yeah, kind of dark. Um, but then there's also some funk happening around the periphery, sort of both in front of it and behind it in the palette. The lime doesn't pop quite as hard, but where it does, it gives this nice little peek out. I don't really get the curacao as orange, but I think it's there. I think it's sort of in between that dark central, you know, Demerara place and the uh, limey place, right? Again, I think the mint on the nose is key. I think without that, you're just having problems. I absolutely love this. Uh, final note on tweaks and why we did or didn't do something. You may be used to seeing this drink with a float of rum, oftentimes like Lemon Heart 151, something like that. Um, that is not the original way. That was a thing done at Trader Vic's bars sometimes. It was called the old way. The reason it was called the old way is because there was this one old guy who would always order it that way. It was not the old way they used to make it, it was the way that some old guy liked it. I'm not opposed to doing that, but I don't think we need it here. This is just a great drink. Well, thank you so much for coming along with me on this Mai Tai adventure this week. I think this drink's a lot of fun. I think that for these sorts of, you know, exotic drinks, it's a sort of nice middle ground where it's not one of the incredibly sweet ones, but it's not one of the incredibly strange ones full of all kinds of spices and, you know, that are really bitters forwards and things that, you know, might take a little bit more adjusting to. This is a sweet rum drink, but with a little bit of a twist. I think it's great. It's a pretty warm day today, sunny day. I'm happy to have a Mai Tai. If you haven't tried one, I would highly recommend giving one a try. Uh, either make it yourself or go to a decent bar for one. This is not a good idea to order this drink at like an Applebee's or something. It will not turn out pretty, I promise. Uh, but I hope you will try one. If you like them, um, making your own Orgia is a little bit of a hassle, but it's worth it. Um, so if you're into it, try it. If not, there are a few makers who make semi-decent Orgia. Um, you want something that looks like it's a little bit weird in the bottle. You know, if you see some separation, some kind of skin forming, um, some layers, that's a good sign. That means that there's actually a bunch of almond milk in it, uh, as opposed to if it just looks sort of like simple syrup, that's a bad sign. So buy some if you want, make some if you want, try this drink this week. That's all we've got for you this week. Do all the YouTube stuff, please. Like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. I'd appreciate it. Uh, go ahead and visit the blog, shakingandsipping.com. We'll have a write-up on this and each other drink. Check back on the blog the day after this video posts for IBA in Real Life, we'll go, where we'll go to a local Seattle cocktail bar, ask them to make it, see if they make it how we did, if they have tweaks on it, if it gets ordered a lot, etc. You'll know when I'm doing one of those by following on Twitter at shaking underscore sipping. That's all we've got for you. I'll be back next week with the next drink on the IBA's list. Until then, happy sipping. Cheers.